about a month and a half ago, I went on holiday with my girlfriend in Costa Rica. Uh, if you've never been there, it's actually pretty awesome. It looks like this. It's beaches, jungles, but most importantly, there is no connectivity whatsoever. What that means is that you essentially spend your day just being uninterrupted and interacting with the real world as it used to be you know, a few years ago. Unfortunately, what happened is every time when we got back to the hotel every evening, all of a sudden we got connected to Wi-Fi and we started getting bombarded by push notifications and people calling us and emails that we need to, to reply urgently. And we got interrupted all the time. We got interrupted you know, when having a dinner date, when we're just like sipping a mojito, uh, when we're actually even making love. It just kept on buzzing and ringing all the time. But that would be okay, right? You could just put your phone away. The problem is we also kept on checking our phones all the time. Even we, when we did not receive a notification, we would just like take a look, open the phone, just in case we had received this one little notification that's important that day. You know, it could be a message for someone you actually love. It could be Ashton Kutcher following you on Twitter. Something that you think is worth checking your phone every five minutes. You could kind of think of it as Pavlov's dog, right? But in this case here, the bell is the notification and the sugar is this one tiny piece of information you care about. So we're so addicted today that in fact, nine out of 10 people experience something called phantom vibrations. This is when you think your phone vibrated in your pocket, but it didn't. See, everybody's laughing, but it's actually not that funny. Because when you think about it, how often in our lifetime have we been so deeply addicted to something that our brain started imagining hallucinating all day long? So, you know, uh, how do you actually get there? When you look at the number, and sorry for the really kind of rough chart that did that before coming. Uh, when you look at the history of connected devices, what you realize is back in the 1990s, you had something called the unplugged era. You had basically no connected device. 1995, roughly, the internet arrived, and then you had your first connected device, your computer, which started sending you emails. Some of them were spam, some of them were like important stuff. But essentially, you had your first form of intrusiveness of technology in your daily workflow. 2005, the mobile era, it's not one, it's three devices. It's a phone, it's a computer, it's a tablet. The problem is that each of these devices have no idea about each other, and therefore the strategy is interrupt everywhere all the time. If you have, for example, you know, a Mac and an iPhone, and someone calls you, it rings on both of them, and even when you reply, it keeps ringing, how annoying is that? Now, try to imagine what's gonna happen with the Internet of Things. We're expected to have 100 billion connected devices by 2025. That's 14 for every person on the planet. Just for a second, try to imagine yourself with 14 devices, none of them being able to synchronize, just basically pushing notifications all day long. And that's not including things like your lamppost, which is gonna be connected as well and everything like that. So you could say that the number of connected devices is proportional to the amount of friction technology brings in your daily life. If you keep looking at the trend, it's actually exponential. So you know, by 2030, it's gonna be uh, maybe a thousand devices. And I don't know about you guys, but I definitely don't want to be living in a world like that. Fortunately, there is one cool thing about AI is that it is anti-friction in a sense. And we're not talking here about you know, AGI or anything like that. We're talking about a specific domain, which is called context awareness. It's essentially giving devices the ability to sense and react to the context of the user and interact accordingly. For example, you know, your push notifications could be filtered automatically based on what you're currently doing. If you're in a meeting, there is no point sending you a social notification. And when you look at the growth in the trend of AI, what you realize is that it takes a little bit longer to start, but we did kind of hit that inflection point now. And when it actually starts growing, it goes much faster. So you know, if the first one is an exponential, this could be a double exponential. What that means is that if AI is anti-friction, at some point, when it becomes capable enough, it will actually be more capable than the problem that we get with connected devices. And this, at that specific point, you're gonna reverse completely the interaction we have with devices, and all of a sudden, it's gonna basically drop down to zero. This is what we call ubiquitous computing. It's essentially the idea that you could keep adding devices, it does not add friction, it actually adds value. You could have a million devices at that point, it keeps adding value. 
And this is important, right? Because when this becomes really ubiquitous, once you get used to the idea that all these devices are kind of working for you in the background and not interrupting you, then you're gonna stop paying attention. If you stop paying attention, it will disappear from your consciousness. And the feeling will be that the world is unplugged with all of the power of technology working for you in the background. So it will feel like the 1990s, but with all the technology today. And I think this is pretty cool, right? Because what it means is that for the next five years, 10 years, it's gonna be horrible. I mean, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's gonna, it's gonna get really bad, like really bad. But down the road, it's actually pretty cool. So we just have to hold just enough time. So, you know, uh, how do you actually build that? Uh, it's not the first time in history that a technology became ubiquitous. For example, electricity, when you think about it, back in the 1800, it was you know, very expensive to produce, it was unreliable, would cut all the time, it was very dangerous, right? So your apartment would catch fire. People actually believed at the time that oil lamps were safer. As it became better and better and more mature, we stopped thinking about it. And today you probably don't realize, but you have electricity so deeply into your life. It's around you, it's in your pocket, it's in your hardware pacemaker, and you don't even think about it anymore. So this is basically what we're trying to do here with technology. The way you build context awareness is through four different layers. The first one is the social layer. So essentially you're trying to model the way that people communicate between them. An example of a way to do that would be to look at your emails and try to figure out in which context are you sending emails to whom and whom is actually inside the same you know, thread as the other person. This essentially gives you the ability to recreate uh, a kind of relationship between people. So you know, it could be, for example, the big bubble in the middle here is my co-founder, definitely sending me too many emails. Uh, he should probably stop. But you can see clusters of people working together. What this means is that if you want to send a message to someone, then your phone potentially could be able to predict who you want to be sending this message to based on the context you're currently in. Now that you have this kind of information, you can also use it to start disambiguating things like calendar events. So if you have something called you know, meeting with Michael, which Michael are we referring to? And this is kind of important, right? Because if you want to have any kind of personal assistance, you need to be able to infer that information. Now that you have this sort of social, uh, social network um, connectivity, then you can figure out that in this context of that meeting at that time at that place, it's more likely to be my co-founder than someone else. And so you can start building more and more intelligence this way. But perhaps more importantly, it's about figuring out what you're currently engaged in in your real life. And a great way to do that is to monitor your location data. Why? Because, I mean, location data is essentially a trace of what you've been doing, doing throughout the day. And if from it you can extract the specific places you've been at and recontextualize that, <coughs> then you can say, well, right now you're in a conference on AI. Therefore, what you might be interested in is, I don't know, maybe the profiles of the people who are talking, or maybe you just want your camera to record or something like that. You can also start aggregating all of that together and you can start essentially creating really accurate maps of what's happening on a population level. Here, for example, in Paris, we did a pretty cool experiment where we aggregated location data for 200,000 people to measure very precisely the population flow in public transport. From this, you can start predicting how many people will be on board the trains, which is actually pretty nice because then now you can adjust the schedules of the trains accordingly as well as tell people that perhaps it should take one a bit later if they want to be comfortable. The same kind of idea could be used to model things like the risk of having a car accident. This is another experiment we've done where we try to basically figure out what is causing car accidents in London. So we model things like the street topology, the weather, the proximity of a bar that just closed, the fact that it's St. Patrick's Day. And what we see is that without any prior knowledge about a specific place, the model can detect that places like Trafalgar Square are indeed a lot more dangerous. So this, in turn, you know, can be put back into a self-driving car who now all of a sudden have uh, an awareness of the context of risk it's exposed to. So you could start telling it, I'd like you to go and pick up my kids at school by minimizing the risk of having an accident on their way back home. And this is sort of the promise of technology, right? Is that you, know, you want to be able to have all of these super intelligent agents all over the place working together to provide something that is really, really, really non-intrusive and powerful. We've even done it for post offices. You know, everybody has to queue at a post office, so we figured, hey, why not try and predict queues at a post office? We can predict that with 90% accuracy. It's that predictable. 
And when you put all that together, right, when you put this you know, device layer, social layer, individual personal layer, environmental layer, what you end up with is a highly contextualized timeline of what someone has been doing throughout the day and in which context. And this is really, really important because once you have this, not only can you infer what they're currently doing, you can also start predicting what they wanna be doing next. And if you have the ability to infer current context and next context, then you can put that kind of intelligence in every single device you interact with so that they can decide what is the best way to interact with you. Should they interrupt you because it's urgent? Should they do it for you? Should they work together in the background so that they would do something else? And you know, whether it's a thermostat or a watch or a bed or anything like that, eventually all of these different devices will be able to figure out your intentions and anticipate everything you wanna do with them. And this is the real promise of context awareness. So anyway, just to wrap up, uh, so yes, you have to sign up because we've built all of that. And we started by building one first product, which is an interface for your phone that simply predicts what you wanna be doing with it based on your current context. So instead of wasting time looking for stuff, typing stuff in your phone, this does it for you automatically. And it's a tiny, tiny thing, right? It's just a first step towards this long-term vision and it's probably not gonna be the right product, I don't know. And to be frank, I don't care because what's important is that we actually try. Because if no one does, then we're gonna end up being enslaved by technology and we're gonna end up spending our days interacting with it instead of doing things we actually care about. Thank you.